Uh, with the release of her book, Cartwheels in a Sari, a memoir of growing up cult, our author for this evening shares with us an incredibly compelling and fascinating coming of age story about life in a nationally recognized spiritual group. Born and raised in the cult of Sri Chinmoy, she was designated before birth as the chosen one for the cult. A child mirac miraculously conceived with the sole purpose of becoming Chinmoy's most devoted disciple, carrying out his every woman desire. Before his death in 2007, Sri Chinmoy was a man who was recognized by world dignitaries such as Nelson Mandela, Mikhail Gorbachev, and even the United Nations as a spiritual luminary, promoter of peace, and advocate for world unity. He attracted followers and included the likes of musicians Carlos Santana, Olympic athlete Carl Lewis, and Grammy winner Roberta Flack. Carlos Inasari, for those of you who have read who may know already, paints quite a different picture of Sri Chinmoy. The book reveals a man hungry with power, who was hypocritical in his proclamations and who exhibited a stronghold over the very people who had innocently turned him for spiritual guidance. The book is heartbreaking, humorous, witty, and hopeful all at once. And for those who might not know, our author is the daughter of our very own, one of our very own here at Darien Library, the Martin of Tam, a children's librarian, who is just I tried to describe Samarpana to somebody the other day, and I said she's a hug when we need one. She's just the sweetest person. And uh, we are so pleased to have her here today to share a story with us. Please join me in welcoming Jayanti Town. Hi, good evening, everyone. I want to thank Erica and Barbara for all their hard work and in inviting me here and I wanted to thank Louise and her amazing staff for welcoming me to your new facility. It's the first time I've been here to the new library and my goodness, it's incredible. It really is overwhelming. I, I only wish I had one like this in my hometown. So, um, all right. So Cartwheels in a Sari is in a sense two stories. It's the story of my family and the story of my life. And it's also at the same time the story of how a cult is formed and how it grows and evolves and changes over time. And for me, the two stories are so intertwined that I can't separate one from the other because my family began as a result of Sri Chinmoy and his mission and it grew and evolved in the ways that Sri Chinmoy wanted it to. So the two stories are in a sense so um, combined at the root that the book tries to weave the two together and show the journey that both took along the way. So to, to begin I'd like to I guess think a little bit about cults and what our society or culture thinks about cults because um, there are a lot of people that I think when you hear the word cult we automatically think of sort of front page news sensational groups right we think of Jim Jones and the Kool-Aid uh, we think about Waco, Texas and the disaster there. But the truth of the matter is that the majority of cults in America today are not the ones that are to be found on the front page, but the ones that are in the communities, right? sort of hidden within the local communities, people that live near you, people that you work with, people that you wouldn't even necessarily know are involved in these groups. And of course the word cult also has a lot of meanings because how does one define what a cult is as opposed to what, let's say, an alternative religion or a spiritual path or sometimes it's referred to as a new religion. And there's been a lot of research to try to define what constitutes that of being a cult and what constitutes that of just being somewhat off the mainstream. So, the Sri Chinmoy Center, by definition, in terms of the research that I've read and the research that I've conducted myself, really falls into the typical classical cult. And there are a couple key characteristics of that. And one is, of course, the fact that the group needs to be based around a central authoritarian figure who maintains complete and utter control over the group. And within that control, that central figure then is in the capacity to regulate everything that the members do, including what they say, what they wear, what they eat, what they do, who they speak to, who they communicate with, everything is controlled. And of course that element of control is essential to maintain the uniformity of the group. 
So to maintain that uniformity, other things are put in place, such as um, banning all contact with the outside world. So there's this clear separation between those inside the group and those outside the group, because it's dangerous, in effect, to have someone who could be on the outside to tamper with the faith or the beliefs of those inside. And finally, within that same realm, if someone leaves the group then, there needs to be a way to ensure that those people don't come back and speak to the people who still maintain the faith of the group. So therefore, once someone leaves, they're banished, they're shunned, and exiled forever, and they're out of, of the group. So I'd like to give some background about Sri Chinmoy himself, the leader of the group. Sri Chinmoy was born in 1931 in a small village called Dhaka, which today is in Bangladesh, India. And he was the youngest of seven children. And at quite a young age, he was around age 11, when both of his parents had passed away. And at that time, the eldest brother of the family made a decision. And he decided that he was going to bring all the sisters and brothers into what's called an ashram. And an ashram is a spiritual community. So he brought all the brothers and sisters into the ashram of a guru in India, in Pondicherry, India, called Sri Aurobindo. And it was there that Sri Chinmoy himself had his formative years. This is what he, he learned from the ashram life. He saw how a guru works. And he really, um, at that point, was sort of forming his own ideas about what he wanted to do with his own life. But of course, Sri Aurobindo was a very different type of guru. And this is important to, to kind of recognize the fact that the, India has a very long tradition of gurus. And the word guru simply means teacher. So there are many authentic teachers who do teach a series of philosophies about how to improve one's life and how to live a happier life and how to attain a level of consciousness that's a higher level. And Sri Aurobindo was one of these authentic teachers and is still considered that in, in India today. But Sri, uh, Sri Chimwa himself had very different plans. And his plans were that he realized in the 1960s what was happening in America at that time was that there was this whole huge market of spiritual seekers who were actively looking for gurus, looking for yogis, swamis, people looking towards the Eastern traditions for answers to life's questions. So we can think sort of the most famous of this would be the Beatles, right? In the 1960s, with all their power and fame and, and money and women, they decided to go to India and sit at the feet of the Maharishi in order to <coughs> achieve some type of illumination, some type of knowledge of the answers to life's mysteries. So Sri Chimoy knew that in America there was this big market, and he decided that he wanted to get in on this. He was a very ambitious man. So when he decided to come to America, he set up shop, not in a small remote town in the middle of the U.S., but he decided that if you want to make it big in America, then you go right to the heart of the matter and you set up shop in New York City. And this is what he did, and his ashram still today is in Queens, New York, and this is where his community has been for, for decades now. So when he arrived, he again was just a small time guru giving meditation classes. And he was trying very hard to bring in new people and, and start his, his mission. All right. So how did my family get involved with it? Well, um, my family story is one that begins with my father's family. My father's family was from Estonia. And they were refugees. They had to flee Estonia when Stalin invaded. And they ended up walking through Europe and ended up in the displaced person's labor camps in Germany. And my father was born in Augsburg, Germany, and lived there until he was four. At that time, his family came through Ellis Island, and his father had a job opportunity in Bismarck, North Dakota. He was an electrical engineer, and at that time, they were designing power lines. So he had a job and position, and his family ended up settling in Bismarck. So Bismarck in the 1950s was very much a small town, traditional place, traditional Americana. His family was Lutheran, and they fit in very well into the, the norm of Bismarck society. But my father never fit in that well. My father was quite an eccentric, and my father always was interested in philosophy. So as an undergraduate, he studied philosophy, and he eventually received a full fellowship to come east to study at Yale University and to get his degree in philosophy. So that's what brought my father out east. My mother's family uh, was a very different 
situation. My mother grew up in Chicago. Her family is of English-Irish descent, and her mother died when she was very young. So my mother was raised by her father, who was an abusive alcoholic, and her home life was a very unhappy one, and her childhood was, uh, was not, not a happy childhood. So she was raised Catholic, she went to Catholic schools, but like my father, she always had a yearning, a desire for something else, and the questions that she was searching for, she wasn't finding any answers within the teachings that were provided to her. So she at an early age also began studying and searching for something else. And when she was at the University of Illinois, she started doing civil rights work and became very involved in that. And eventually she met someone who she ended up marrying and they decided to leave and leave Chicago and go out to San Francisco because in the 60s, San Francisco and in particular Haight-Ashbury was really the epicenter of all things happening that were spiritual. So they went out to San Francisco and it was there that she tried on different faiths and religions and sects. So she tried the Hare Krishnas, the Baha'i, Sufi, you name it, she tried it. But nothing felt right. Nothing sort of hit the spot in the way that she was hoping it would. So uh, her husband at that time became really involved in the free love movement and decided that he wanted to explore those at lanes. My mother at that point had a newborn son and decided that was not a direction she wanted to go. So she packed up her son and came east. And all she had was the name and address of this guru that she had heard about, this newly arrived guru from India, and she was curious about this man. So she decided to go and, and see what it was all about. So I'd like to, um, to read a section uh, that explains how I entered the picture because on the night that my mother went to a meditation and this at this time the guru lived in the East Village and he lived in a tenement apartment and the meditation that he held was in his apartment and it was a very informal group of people. It was just a bunch of seekers who once a week came together with the guru to simply do meditation exercises. So it was at that night at that meditation that my mother went and she said that she looked at this guru and he had an incredible beautiful smile and he was wearing dhoti which is a traditional Indian dress and he told her to sit down next to this long-haired man who was barefoot sort of hippie man so she did she sit, sat down next to him and during that meditation both my mother and father said that they felt something real from this guru that there was something tangible there was a sense of peace there was a sense of light and at the end of that meditation, they were both so impressed. And the guru said to my mother, if you want to make fast progress in your spiritual life, I'd like you to do two things. I want you to become my disciple and take initiation from me. And I want you to marry the man that you're sitting next to. So while it seems improbable, I think for a lot of us, uh, my parents agreed and it was really this leap of faith that they took and again both of them felt as though this was the person they had been searching for all their lives. This was the holy man who was going to bring them to nirvana. This was the person who was going to answer all the questions that they had. And, and they did. They became disciples and uh, shortly after that's when things started to change. So I'd like to read a section from the early part of the book that talks about that change and how, how I came into the story here. Almost as soon as my parents committed themselves to Guru as full-time disciples, Guru rapidly changed his small informal meditation circle into a structured organization. Since Guru wanted all his disciples to expedite their spiritual growth, he prescribed a lifestyle that, according to him, would guarantee the quickest route toward self-perfection. He prohibited all activities he considered dangerous detours alcohol, caffeine, smoking, drugs, TV, radio, movies, music, newspapers, magazines, books not written by Guru, meat, dancing, and pets. In addition, all disciples were to remain single. According to Guru, traditional families created insurmountable tangles and distractions that at best delayed, but more often derailed, true seekers in their quest for enlightenment. There were, however, a few exceptions. Gur sanctioned certain unions that he arranged and labeled as divine marriages. 
create it to encourage intensified spiritual practice to achieve faster than the fastest progress in their inner lives, Guru paired a number of new disciples with the mandate that they marry but remain celibate. Shortly after my parents' divine marriage, in 1969, my mother became pregnant, <laughs> clearly violating Guru's policy. The problem of my mother's pregnancy drove an immediate thorny wedge between the newlyweds who were still strangers to each other. Nervous to confess to Guru, they felt ashamed and embarrassed. Guru scolded my parents for being undivine and indulging in lower vital forces that threatened to eradicate all of their spiritual hunger. My parents were mortified and pleaded with Guru that their failing was due to weakness and not out of deliberate disobedience. Eventually, Guru's infinite compassion intervened. He pleaded with the Supreme, his word for God, and told my parents that the Supreme was so moved by Guru's prayers that he decided to allow Guru to turn what he called this undivine episode into a spiritual boon. Guru then announced that he had contacted the highest heaven and arranged for a special soul to incarnate as his chosen disciple. My grateful parents humbly vowed to never again indulge in lower vital activities and renewed their undying commitment to Guru to never permit the trappings of family to deter them from spiritual progress. They understood that what held them together was Guru and Guru alone. He served as the foundation of their marriage and lives. As in all great faiths of the world, Guru too had stories to answer the unanswerable, to explain the unexplainable, to rationalize the irrational. His story was me, the miracle child. In the history of the Sri Chinmoy Center, from its humble beginnings in 1964 to its present day expansion with more than 7,000 followers around the world and the hundreds of thousands of ex-disciples and seekers who, for however fleeting a time, came to experience Guru's presence, I, according to the legend originally told by Guru and then repeated endlessly by disciples around the world, am the only soul to have been personally invited, selected, or commanded to incarnate into his realm on earth. Though mine wasn't proclaimed a virgin birth, he announced that I descended from the highest heavens to be an exemplary disciple. I was to be the Ananda to Buddha, the Peter to Jesus, the Lakshmana to Rama, a devoted sacrificial being, selfless and tireless, pleasing the master unconditionally. The myth of my birth was one of Guru's favorite stories that he repeated over the years. Although it changed slightly depending on his mood, the standard version is the following. At 6.01 on a warm morning in September 1970, my soul entered the world, landing in a Connecticut hospital. My exhausted mother beamed and clutched me tightly to her breast while my father was in the parking lot waiting for Guru. Guru was being chauffeured from Queens, New York, and as soon as he arrived, my father escorted Guru directly into the nursery. According to Guru, my first darshan, official blessing, occurred an hour after my birth. Guru walked up to the window and spotted me. I, like the other shriveled, stunned newborns, was asleep. Guru had brought with him my name. In Eastern traditions, a spiritual name means receiving a new life, a new identity. My mother, originally Kathleen, was given the name Samarpana by Guru, and my father, originally Tonis, was renamed Rudra. My parents would never have considered naming me themselves. I was Guru's. He picked out the name Jayanti, meaning the absolute victory of the highest supreme. Guru started meditating on me, sending me an inner message to wake up and respond to his presence. In the first of many of my great acts of disobedience and disappointment, I continued sleeping. <laughs> Again, Guru intently concentrated on me, attempting to stir me, yet I offered no reply. Feeling frustrated, he inwardly told my soul, is this your gratitude? I specially chose you from the highest heavens to come to earth to be with me, and this is your gratitude? You do not acknowledge your guru? Bah! At this point, I uncurled my fingers and moved my hands together in a prayerful pranam, opened my eyes and slightly bowed my head and neck into my chest. It was a perfect moment, an act of unconditional surrender, a pure bhakti devotion. It was miraculous and yet expected. It was my first test and I had passed it, cementing my status, cementing my bonds. So that of course is the beginning and I sort of joke that when you're born as the chosen one with all those great expectations as to what you're going to do 
in your life and how you're going to please the master, then really the only where you can go if you're put up on this pedestal, right? The only place you can go is to come crashing down. And I think in a sense the rest of Cartwheels and Asari is my story about that slow and inevitable decline off the pedestal that he had put me on at my birth. Um, but my family, you know, from this point, we, we were there. We were in and we were his foot soldiers to do whatever he wanted us to do. And he wanted us to do a lot because uh, Sri Chinmoy had, as I said before, he had these great ambitions and that's what brought him to America from India. And he decided that he was going to come and become the next Dalai Lama. He wanted to be an internationally known world-renowned spiritual figure that was at the helm of an organization with worldwide centers and with millions of disciples. So how do you build that? Well, you build that by having, you know, by starting with the people closest to you. So right away, the guru did a couple things that I think are really indicative of what his ultimate ambitions were. One of the things that he did right away was he changed the name of the group. It was originally called the Om Center. And some of you who do yoga probably know that Om is a sacred uh, Sanskrit word and it means the soundless sound. It represents the trinity, right? The creator, the preserver, the destroyer, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. So he originally had his group called the Om Center, but I think he realized that if he was just yet another small, uh, small town guru giving meditation classes, he's not going to achieve what he wanted. So he switched the name from the Om Center and renamed his organization the Sri Chinmoy Center, which is what it's still referred to today. And with that shift, of course, is the whole shift in focus away from the disciples and their own spiritual life and to him. So the Sri Chinmoy Center became this official vehicle for him, by him, and about him, for him to achieve the goals that he set. And a lot of the goals that he set were these incredible goals that demanded a lot of uh, foot soldiers to do the work. So right away, the guru made a few changes. And one of the things that he did was, he told my father, who again had been studying philosophy, he told my father to drop out and forget the philosophy and go to law school instead. And why law school? Because the guru decided that he wanted to have my father serve as his personal lawyer. So my father did. He went to law school, got his law degree, and the very first thing that he ended up doing out of law school was he created the Sri Chimoy Center as an official tax-free church, thus giving it all the privileges and status of an organization that would need in order for, um, you know, to kind of begin its movement. And the other thing that Sri Chimoy did at this time was he told my family, since we were already in Connecticut, since that's where my father was going to school, to stay in Connecticut and be his Connecticut missionaries because at that time he realized that he wanted to start having groups in all 50 states and then spread worldwide. So our house then, we initially lived in Wilton, then we lived in Norwalk, and we finally moved to Greenwich, but our house was the official Sri Chinmoy Center. And we lived upstairs, and the basement then was where the disciples would come every week for meditation. And all the people who were interested in meditation in the Connecticut area would come to our house. And on Monday nights, in the early days, Sri Chinmoy would come and meditate with all of these disciples in our, in our basement. And these, of course, were sort of the early days when um, there were few enough disciples that people could fit in the basement, first of all, and that the guru decided it was worth his time traveling to Connecticut to see them. Uh, during the 80s, things changed, and he decided that he no longer was going to travel. If disciples wanted to come, they'd have to go to, to see him. And all the other nights, uh, we did that as well, besides Monday nights. We would travel to Queens, to his ashram, and we would meditate with him. So he began a number of things that were kind of strategic for him to spread his mission. One was that he figured out that he wanted to get in with the United Nations because what would give him instant credibility was having a connection with the UN. So one of his early disciples actually used to work at the United Nations Secretariat building. And she figured out that in order to start an informal club there, all you needed was a signature of two people that worked at the UN. So two people signed up that they wanted to have this meditation club. And the next thing you know, Sri Chinmoy had this permanent place to go and now called himself the Sri Chimoy Peace Ambassador of the United Nations and that he went to the UN twice a week to hold peace meditations. Now having this right on his resume on a CV certainly all of a sudden gave him a huge boost. 
he ended up courting the Secretary General at that time, Utant, and Utant came actually to one of Sri Chinmoy's meetings and had photos with, with Guru and then uh, Sri Chinmoy used those photos then to meet other people and that's how he started meeting with all these world figures and celebrities because of course when other people see, oh well, you know, Utant said it's okay, then the next person would say the same thing. So thus began his pitch of what he called manifestation and that was to get as many disciples as possible. Um, I'd like to to read another section from the book about this period of time where we were constantly on the go because he was out there giving lectures, giving concerts in this attempt to get more and more disciples. Um, I think there are two things that I need to explain before I, I read this one clip. Um, one was that early on Sri Chimoy decided that he no longer wanted disciples to have easy access to him. So no longer could you just call him up or come and approach him in a room. Instead, he decided that disciples had to stay at a distance. And if he wanted to speak to you, he would address you, and then you could speak to him. Otherwise, you could try to write a message to him or pass a note to him. And he asked his male disciples to serve as his fleet of personal bodyguards. And therefore, they were to protect him and kind of keep him apart from sort of the riffraff of, of, of the everyday disciple. And the other thing in this section that when Sri Chimoy was still in India at the ashram, he befriended a Canadian woman and he asked for her help in terms of filling out all the paperwork that was necessary to come to America and get a green card. And what he promised her was that he promised her if she aided him in setting up shop in America as a guru, that he would give her a special position. And the position would be um, his sort of spiritual equal. And she would be considered the consort. And this also is sort of a long tradition in India of having a representation of the divine in both a masculine and a feminine form. So Alu Devi was meant to represent the female form of the divine. Um, but of course, once Sri Chimoy got to America and he started gaining more disciples and gaining more power and gaining inns with various celebrities, he didn't really need her anymore. So then came this strange tension as to what and what to do with Alo Devi. All right, so uh, we read this one section where um, we are on tour. Okay. During this time, Guru was perpetually on tour throughout the United States and Canada, giving free concerts and lectures and a frenzied effort to expand his mission, and so were we. Weekends, therefore, meant bus trips. In the bus, Guru reserved the first row for himself, and then positioned Prema and Isha on the seat across from him. The rest of the bus was by invitation only, and getting onto Guru's bus was a prized privilege. Other buses trailed behind with sad disciples who sat facing their windows with folded hands just in case they might pass Guru's bus in traffic, and they could have a few seconds of a highway blessing via Guru's window. My family always got invited onto Guru's bus, which meant that in addition to being entertained by Guru, spontaneously singing, telling stories, and passing out prasad. We received special perks, like keeping count of the drawings that he did on everything from placemats to napkins. The buses we traveled on were not luxury models, but low-budget rejects, like retired school buses without heat. Inevitably, on each trip, we had mechanical problems. One freezing and sleet-drenched night, on our way back home from Guru's public concert, the bus's engine began smoking, and we quickly pulled off the nearest exit. A few of the guards, including my father, who also rotated as one of the official drivers, bundled up and headed outside to fiddle with the engine. Alo had been at the concert, but she had driven down from Canada with Roshan and Hira. I had watched Alo in the auditorium, she was in the row in front of me, and for the entire concert her head drooped asleep, like a wilted tulip. In her defense, even a short concert for Guru was at least three hours long. His concerts always started late. He began with a silent meditation, then improvised on many musical instruments, none of which he knew how to play. <laughs> As usual, before Guru entered the stage, the hall was full. Disciples responsible for producing the event wanted to give Guru a packed house, and so for months they soaked the city with posters, gluing everything from bulletin boards to phone booths, and blitzing neighborhoods with leaflets. The more people in attendance, the more pleased Guru was with the event. Numbers mattered. If Guru was going to transform humanity, it was advantageous for him to appear before big crowds. 
The biggest audiences came when the famed guitarist Carlos Santana, whom Guru named Davideep, became a disciple. After receiving initiation, Guru instructed Santana to marry his girlfriend, Deborah. Although they lived in California, they often came to New York to bask in Guru's divinity and have Guru as their muse. As a great honor and privilege for Santana, Guru invited him to perform during Guru's concerts. Inevitably, however, though the house may have been packed at the beginning of the night after Santana finished playing, bowing both to the audience and to Guru, then left the stage, most of the audience fled. Those who did stay to see Guru's follow-up act exited shortly after as Guru scraped a bow across his cello while singing Bengali songs. For nine years as Devadeep, Santana devoted himself to Guru's path, receiving special attention from Guru with every visit until suddenly he was gone. I remember Guru sitting on his porch chastising Santana and his wife, blaming their broken spiritual lives on their disobedient desire to start a family. Santana instantly became an ex-disciple, and Guru told us Santana would drown in the ignorant sea, and immediately all of his relationships with the center were formally and permanently severed. I was used to this by now. When a disciple left, Guru forbade any contact. It did not matter how fond one was of the person, that ex-disciple had to be discarded. So many disciples came and left that cutting off a person from my life even someone I had known from when I was learning to crawl now felt normal. One couldn't or shouldn't get too attached. I'd learned how to scab over quickly until I couldn't feel anything anymore and an ex-disciple was just another name added onto the rapidly expanding blacklist. Santana's break with Guru, however, did have a profound effect on concert attendance. With Guru as the headliner and only act, the less than full houses had early mass evacuations. Although I understood that the concerts were hours and hours long and the music was unbearable, the people who left, I concluded, were simply unenlightened and didn't understand the larger purpose. I felt sorry for them. Here they were given an opportunity by the Supreme himself to become a disciple of the highest avatar and they blew it. It really was their loss. At three in the morning, shivering, I huddled against my mother and the broken down bus. Due to chronic mechanical trouble, the bus's engine stalled, and from my seat beside the window, frigid winds seeped through the glass. Besides the distant beads of light from the highway, everything outside was dark. I sighed with the realization that if the bus was repaired within the next hour or so, I might still make it home in time for school. Not only would I not have had any sleep, but my language arts report, like the majority of my homework, had not even been started. When I asked my mom if she thought I'd make it to school on time, she told me not to worry, that she would happily call in sick for me. With all of my absences, I was the sickest kid enrolled, the local hypochondriac. I didn't mind, since I always felt absent at school, even when I was present. Long after I had stopped dressing in saris and decorating my cubby with photos of Guru and Nirvakalpi Samadhi, an elevated state of consciousness, the kids at Silvermine Elementary School still remembered. Tommy Frangelo, a boy who lived down the road from my house, told a legion of kids that he saw my family sacrificing a monkey and then drinking its blood. <laughs> because one of the ancient Hindu sacred signs is a swastika, it became standard knowledge that on top of everything else, the Tams were Nazis too. Guru woke up. Oi, are you people still alive? Guru asked, tapping on the microphone of the Bruss's broken PA system. Or are you all in the sleep world? Toward the front of the bus, a few muffled murmurs responded from beneath mouths wrapped with scarves. I am in such pain, excruciating pain, Guru said. I knew Guru hurt. His slight limp at the beginning of the concert became a definitive wobble that caused him to move extra slowly, pausing between steps onto the bus. Seeing Guru in such obvious discomfort pierced me with guilt. The blame was mine, as well as all the other disciples who were constantly failing him with our selfish needs. My complaints about the freezing bus, the lack of sleep and food, I knew were ungrateful and uninspired, which resulted in desires and longings for myself rather than Guru. And the price was paid by Guru yet again. I slunk into my seat, wishing I could reverse all the damage I had done. You cannot and will never know what this Guru has to carry. So much dead elephant weight I suffer from carrying your problems, vital problems, which are emotional problems, mental problems. But my suffering does not end there. So merciless does Allo torture me. 
endless are her attacks on me. Her fierce jealousy and her demands create such problems. You people will never know what type of problems she makes for me in the inner and outer world. She is determined to make me suffer and to make the Supreme's will suffer. The pain you see I have in the outer world is so insignificant to what, at every moment, I have in the inner world. Most excruciating, most excruciating, Allah was responsible for wanting to ruin me and the will of the Supreme. I had never heard Guru speak about Allah in such a blunt and negative way. From the disciples, I had learned that joking about Allah in her absence and worshipping Allah in her presence were politically advantageous. Beyond that, I overheard comments Prema and Isha tossed over their shoulders at meditation for a warning that the witch was returning to town. But I had not realized the severity of Allah's effect on Guru and the suffering she caused for him. I knew my own ignorance and lack of spiritual aspiration created his pain. He had given me proof in a written statement proclaiming my worst quality. Three years earlier, at a fundraiser for $25, disciples could stand before Guru as he wrote out their worst quality. My parents thought this was a great idea. For a special gift, they signed me up. After my term was over, I needed help from my mom to explain what it meant. Deliberate disobedience on the lower vital plane. I did not understand. My mother informed me that the lower vital plane was the part of the being that harbored impure thoughts, emotions, and desires. At nine, my impure thoughts had been that Caton could be a jerk, and my dad wore the same stinky, sweaty t-shirt that he had run in, and then dried off on the radiator for the remainder of the day. To witness Guru speaking about Alo now, with such pain in his voice, was new and surprising. The problem of Alo obviously was dire, but as with everything else, I had been too selfish and unaware to notice. What was wrong with me? My own intuition was non-existent. I loved Alo, and secretly, even though it was bad, I still loved her. This probably caused Guru extra suffering. Guru? A woman asked. Oi, Guru replied. A question? It was dark, and in my seat, I couldn't see into the rows behind. Is there something that we can do to help you with Alo? she questioned. I was glad that she asked this. I really wanted to know. Could you not kill her? Guru said. The world paused, stuck in a moment, frozen. Only the wind moved, bleeding through the glass onto me, giving me chills. I did not want to hear anymore. I felt afraid of Guru and what he wanted. It all felt wrong. I turned away toward the window that offered an illusion of the world outside with no lights and only deep darkness. Somewhere I remembered the snaky arms of the Guru bust in the backyard curling and lapping their way toward my bedroom, awaiting my eventual return. Half an hour later, the bus was fixed and merrily on its way when Guru told the driver to pull over to a Howard Johnson's rest stop. As a sleepy disciple stretched and stumbled off the bus, confusion churned in my head. Nothing made sense. I must have misunderstood Guru. Language had different meanings for moments, and words slipped between meanings quickly, as when crossing between rooms. What I heard Guru say felt wrong, yet I knew that was impossible. He could never be wrong. Unsettled and with my stomach throbbing with discomfort, I turned toward my mother, who stood in the aisle zipping up her coat. There was a line to disembark as disciples packed tightly in front and behind her. I wanted to confess my distress to my mother, but I knew I couldn't. In my family, as in the center, we did not speak openly. Guru's standard policy was that disciples who questioned him were problematic and needed to be turned in for punishment. Criticisms, concerns, and suggestions about the center were evidence of one's own spiritual corruption. Rather than expose my own weaknesses and risk being reported, it was much safer to keep my concerns to myself. As the chosen one, I had a lot to lose. Mom, I asked in a low voice. She looked at me with deeply tired, apologetic eyes. I had a good meditation tonight, I said. So, um, the guru, of course, set himself up to be this person that, in a sense, could never be wrong. And the reason he did this was because he claimed that he was an avatar. And an avatar is the incarnation of God in a human form. So he told the disciples that while there had been many avatars who had incarnated on earth prior to him, so he admitted that Jesus was an avatar, Muhammad, Buddha, that there had been a string before him, but he told us that he was the very last. 
He was the final avatar, the final time that God would take a human form. And not only that, but he also was the highest avatar. So for his disciples then, the promise that he gave was that this was it. This was not just a once in a lifetime because again, he believed in reincarnation and so did we. But this was a once in an eternal series of lifetimes to study and to be with God in human form. And of course, when he makes the claim that he is God, then everything he says has to be done, right? I mean, there's no question, there's no doubt. And every wish that he you know, asked us to fulfill, of course, was something that we needed to, to do right away, whether or not it sort of made sense to us. But again, this is God telling us what he wanted and what disciples should be doing. So thus, it was an absolute authority and who would question God? And also for my parents then, uh, their belief was that if, and again, their faith was so strong that they thought, okay, well, this is indeed God in human form. So the best thing they could offer for their family was to have their children raised by God. What could be better? And as long as you have that belief then, it perpetuates and it allows you know, our whole life to be about and devoted to Sri Chinmoy. And of course, over the years then, as the book you know, progresses in the chapters, I'm older and older, and those kind of early doubts and moments where I see things and hear things that I think, hmm, you know, there, there are problems here, um, that becomes more extreme the older I get. And of course, when you're raised in a celibate cult, right, uh, when you become a teenager and you decide that you're interested in boys and dating, all of that is completely forbidden. So that becomes yet a whole other challenge as far as how to, um, you know, tr try to figure out a way to live one's life. So I started rebelling against the Guru's orders and which of course caused him a lot of trouble because here as his chosen one I certainly wasn't behaving in a way that he expected as being this model behavior for other disciples to look to. So we ended up um, you know, for a number of years sort of battling each other and I had tried to leave the group at a number of times and he kind of pulled me back and this went back and forth and during this time he of course was into all these other ventures and offerings and some of you might have heard about Sri Chimoy because of his various um, activities that he put on so from long distance running uh, to musical events to uh, weightlifting which became this bizarre uh, manifestation where he decided that to attract attention from the media he was going to start this series of, of miracles where he would lift these enormous objects. So we just moved to Greenwich. Uh, I was just starting junior high school. And the guru came to our house, our little house in uh, Greenwich. And in our front yard came and weight lifted an elephant on a <laughs> contraption that the disciples had designed for him. It was sort of a calf raise machine. And uh, he bent down and stood up. And then the elephant stood on the platform, and then of course, you know, we all clapped and cheered. And he weightlifted people, he weightlifted celebrities, so Nelson Mandela, Susan Sarandon, you name it, he lifted them. Um, to then having sites named in honor of him. So believe it or not, the Statue of Liberty was renamed a Shu Chimwe Peace Blossom. Uh, so was Niagara Falls. I mean, his disciples were out there trying to. Uh, really put his presence and his stamp on everything. So these were all the activities going on while in my own life I was having a complete um, an utter meltdown. And I ended up, uh, he actually banished me from the group in 1995 and that was the, the last time. So um, I think what I'd like to do now is uh, perhaps we can open it up to questions and we can sort of hear your comments and questions if you have about the book or about Sri Chimoy or, or cults in general. Yes. What do you still have in your life that you brought with you from your childhood? Like, do you meditate? Or do you eat meat? And, I mean, or have you, have you completely left all those um, traditions? Okay, so, so the question was, what do I still do now that's a remnant of my past growing up in the cult? Um, yeah, the, the idea of being a vegetarian, that's the one rule that always made sense to me, and I think that was because I, I loved animals. So I'm still a vegetarian. I've never eaten meat my whole life, and I'm actually now raising my daughter to be a vegetarian too, so that's, that's held strong to me. Um, the other thing, no, as far as meditation, I don't practice meditation at all because for us as disciples, we meditated on his image, on Sri Chimoy's photograph or on him as a person. So if this was a gathering, if this was a meditation, you'd all be sitting on the floor 
and he would be on a raised platform on a throne up on the stage and we would be with folded hands meditating on him so even the word meditation all I can see is an image of him in my head so I don't have any uh, desire to continue meditation or any type of spiritual practice I think um, the idea of putting all my faith in a single person is something that I am really not not willing to do at this point yeah thanks in the back what I want to hear about is what was it like internally for you right before and during and after leaving? Uh, well, the, the question is what was it like internally before, during, and after leaving? I was, I was an absolute mess. I mean, to the point where I had tried to commit suicide because I didn't feel that I could successfully live or wanted to live because my life that I was supposed to live, according to Sri Chimwe, was to be his devoted disciple at his feet all day, every day, and have no desires or ambitions for myself other than that. So, and I knew that that was not something I, I could do. So that really had been from quite an early age, I you know, was getting a sense that you know, there was a problem here and I wasn't going to be able to be this person he wanted me to be so I always felt conflicted and struggled with that because you know my mind questioned things and you're not supposed to question things and you can't talk about your problems or questions so you just internalize everything and uh, keep it all to yourself and then of course after I left initially I was terrified because you know what do you do how do you sort of start start a life on the outside in, in the so-called you know normal world which he sort of told us was was a very bad thing and that my soul would punish me and I would have terrible things happen to me so I was always afraid and then eventually you figure out how to you know to create a life and then uh, with the help of a lot of therapy that always <laughs> makes you know makes things uh, better for us so I, I did therapy and eventually you know you come to some type of understanding and you, you know have peace with everything that happened before yes what are you have a relationship with them? Right, so um, my parents stayed in the group. I left in 1995 and my parents ended up uh, leaving the group in 2002 and actually my father was kicked out of the group and one of the things that happened was um, that prior to this of course when a disciple left there was no communication with other disciples but one of the other people, former members who actually was raised in the center like I was, his parents were still disciples, he ended up forming a chat group online and created this forum where ex-disciples could post their stories and testimonials and experiences and this was the first time that this had happened. So of course when you have this forum then all sorts of stories start coming out and many of these stories were very dark disturbing allegations of sexual abuse uh, that Sri Chimoy did with his female disciples including one case where uh, the woman became pregnant by him and he told her to have an abortion so all these stories started coming out in this public way and the guru was terrified he forbid his disciples from going online he forbid his disciples from googling I mean this was the last thing he wanted was to have these types of you know stories out there so my father who claims that he had been having doubts for years ended up going to the site reading these allegations and then going back and actually talking to people about them, other disciples, and that was too much. So even though my father had served the guru as his lawyer for all those decades, at that point, you know, the guru thought my father was more of a liability and kicked him out, and my mother then used that as a great excuse to leave, and she had been wanting to leave um, for a number of years before that herself. So they're, they're out. I have a great relationship. My mother actually works here part-time at the Children's Library, and I uh, have a really close, wonderful relationship with her. My father ended up moving back to Bismarck, North Dakota, and uh, lives back there. Uh, my brother is still a devout disciple and um, hasn't spoken to me in years. My aunt, my father's sister, also is a devout disciple and remains you know, totally committed to the group and, and hasn't spoken to any, any of us in years. Yeah. Yes, sir? Yeah. Um, my daughter. She oh, wow. Left about four or five years ago. She's still very troubled. Mm -hmm. And I would like to know what I can say to her on the basis of your experience. Excuse me. Yeah. That might be helpful. I, I don't know what to say to her. Well, I. She has a life. She 
has a, her own apartment now. <coughs> she's gone through yeah. a lot of experiences that I think are very bad. Yes. What can I say to her? I, I would urge her to speak to somebody to try to go into therapy She's done that. and and hopefully you know she'll find a therapist that she can find will sort of help her discover um, what had happened to her and help her sort of process that um, I'd be happy after to maybe you know talk to you privately too and um, you know there, there is again this forum where former disciples can share their stories and perhaps maybe speaking Speaking with some other former disciples might be helpful for her to process some of the things that happened to her. Um, yeah, it, it's difficult and it takes a long time. Again, I, I left in 95 and those first few years were, were, were terrible and chaotic. And um, it's only now after so much time has passed that I felt I even had the objectivity to write this book. That I could look at my experiences without sort of anger and confusion. And, um, and process everything I'd gone through. So it does take time, a decade, maybe, maybe even more. She, she lost some of the most important years of her life. Right. Yeah. From 20 to 40. And, yeah, and, and in that way too, I, I feel very grateful because since I was born into it, you know, if it's the first 25 years now, at least I, I you know, have a family which I'm so grateful for and I was able to, um, to build a career but yes, people that have been in it during those sort of pivotal years, you come out and it's, it's extremely difficult because the center becomes your everything. It's your church, it's your community, your friends, it's your economic lifeline, it's your whole set of beliefs. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? There, in, in Greenwich, there was a vegetarian mm -hmm. restaurant. Love and Serve, yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. Now that was related, because I would always see his posters mm -hmm. up. Right, that was owned by disciples, um, a series of disciples. They kind of sold it to other disciples. And I believe it burned down in a fire a number of years ago. But um, yeah, absolutely. And that, that's called the divine enterprise, when a disciple owns a business. And they're all very similar. They're all painted blue. They all have pictures of the guru. And they have his books and his music. And disciples are the only ones who are allowed to work there. My brother actually owns a divine enterprise in Queens, two blocks from, from the ashram and a cafe in that same way. So this was a, a way to keep disciples, to have a place where outside people could come and find out about Guru. And also it kept disciples from sort of having to take jobs in the outer world because they would work with each other. And it would be this you know, kind of point of like safety for, for other people. But um, yeah, Love and Serve was a fixture in Greenwich for, for years. And Westport. And Westport, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Premananda owned it there. Yeah. Yes? Uh, Sri Chinmoy is viewed by some people as the great and final avatar. Mm -hmm. He's viewed by others as a uh, narcissistic megalomania. Mm -hmm. Who and what was he in your opinion? <laughs> well, from the book, it's... I mean, my discovery of him was, was the, the latter, you know, was that he was a person who had created this whole story and had taken all these people who were true spiritual seekers. I mean, if anything, I think that's the real tragedy, that my parents were devout seekers looking for a true spiritual life, and then this person came and sort of hijacked their spiritual search into, you know, a vehicle for his own kind of gain. So I, I see him that way. I mean, I, I believe the allegations of sexual abuse. So I think there was this whole double standard in terms of what he was telling his disciples to do and live and the way he himself lived. And I think he ex exploited his disciples to achieve his own, his own goals. And, and then, of course, it's interesting because you're very right in saying some people truly believe that he was this realized soul, this great yogi, this great swami. And if you go to his official website, uh, shrichinmoy.org, um, you'll see there are these glowing comments from people like, you know, Mother Teresa and Al Gore, Nelson Mandela, um, you know, praising the Pope, praising Sri Chinmoy. And, and you think, well, how can that be? But of course, when he would meet people like that, 
they had no idea about what he actually did with his own core of disciples or what he demanded from them. I mean, the PR machine that he had as his followers would package him in a way that, well, here's this man who's devoted his life to world peace. So, I mean, you know, what's wrong with that? That's a great thing, right? And so even when he passed away in the New York Times, they wrote this really glowing obituary about him. Um, and it's because if you look sort of on a surface level, you know, there he was talking about peace, giving these very sort of general aphorisms about world peace and love and light and, you know, living a better life. So people who just kind of touched lightly on that, the celebrities that would come and have a little meditation with him and then leave for their own world, thought, thought he was great. Did he have spiritual power for, for certain? Well, this is, this is, I guess, another question. I mean, any time you have the leader of a worldwide organization with literally thousands of people that he controlled, there's something, right? And whatever you want to call that, something that has people, you know, listen and obey. So if it's charisma, if you want to call it, you know, occult power, spiritual power, but there's truly something that people felt like my parents did when they were at a meditation with him. Um, they attributed it to Sri Chinmoy. I think you could also attribute it to any time you're in a yoga class and you're doing a guided visualization and there's a bunch of people in there, you know, kind of putting out good energy and good vibrations, you could say, well, there's something tangible in that sense, right? Any time people are all kind of wishing for something positive. I, I don't see anything genuine in terms of what, what he did. I, I see that he really was um, driven to just come and fulfill his own, his own desires. Okay, in the back? Yeah. Um, yes. The scene in Paris where you're handing out the blue flyers <laughs> seemed to be a real turning point for you. Even though you'd had doubts, was that the first time you really started to think of it as a cult? Um, she's referring to, there's a scene in the book, and this is actually um, after I had fallen in love with someone, and to sort of rescue my soul, the guru put me on a plane and sent me to the south of France, which I guess is a bizarre place to be sent, right, if you've fallen in love. Uh, one of the most romantic places in the world, but um, he had a center there, Montpellier, in the south of France, so there was a, a woman I could live with and a divine enterprise to work in. And I stayed there for about a year in my so-called spiritual rehabilitation. Um, and he was giving a concert in Paris. So we as disciples would be out there trying to get people to come to the concert. So we'd be leafleting on the streets of Paris. And the French, you know, the French aren't so taken by things that they find odd, right? In terms of uh, Europe, they're sort of considered the least religious or the least superstitious. So the French government had actually come up with an official list of cults and didn't allow those groups to rent uh, facilities from you know, government buildings. So they were really trying to sort of get these groups off. So on that list was included Scientology, the Sri Chimoy Center, et cetera. So um, I was handing out leaflets and someone came up and basically said, oh, this guy's a phony, this guy's a fake, it's, you know, it's a cult. Uh, yeah, to me, you know, clearly that was sort of a, a moment, a shocking moment, but I wouldn't say that you know, that was a definitive moment. For me, it was, I guess, a long, slow series of, of events to kind of make me start thinking about, you know, well, what is this really and, and what am I doing? And then, of course, there's still the whole wave of doubt because, you know, then I think, oh, no, there's something wrong with me. You know, this is, I'm just being attacked by a negative force, right? You know, this is, uh, uh, I'm wrong, it's, you know, Guru's divine and everything is wonderful, but um, yeah, that certainly kind of rocked, rocked my foundation for a while, yeah. Yes? Who's leading the group now? Okay, the question is, who's leading the group now? Uh, Sri Chimoy himself passed away in 2007, but the group continues on, and Sri Chimoy never set up for a single leader to take over, because I don't think that he ever wanted to even think about his own mortality. So he would um, never talk about it. He didn't set anything up. So there's not a single person who sits on his throne, but there is a sort of group of elder disciples who run things in a manner that they see befitting to what he would have wanted. And included in that group, um, I'm told, is the woman in the book who I called Isha. So she's central to running 
running the organization. And it's still active today. I mean, they're still doing events and concerts and classes, um, you name it, world records. The day that my book came out in April, they wanted to get some PR away from my book and from me, so they ended up having a, a world record where disciples recited one of Guru's poems in, I think, over 100 languages. And it was in the Daily News and, you know, it got some media attention. So they're very active still and now interested, I think, in legacy building. I was told that they want to acquire land by the ashram to build a museum for, for Sri Chinmoy. Yes, in the front. Were there many um, who started at birth in the group leaving? Have many of the, I mean, I would see how difficult it must have been for you to leave because we really didn't know any other life at all. Um, were there many other young people that started in the group um, that have left or are most still in? Or well, again, uh, Sri Chimoy made this decision that um, he wanted his disciples to be single and celibate. So once they joined the group, then they no longer could have families, could have children, etc. Um, and he kind of took a gamble on that because, as we all know, groups like the Shakers eventually died out, right? When you don't have new generations of people coming after. But he thought that it was more advantageous for him to have a whole fleet of single people because single people would have more time, money, and energy to devote all their life to him rather than people with families who then kind of get sidetracked by you know, what they have to do with their family. So, um, but that being said, there certainly were other families that came and joined. So other people came and brought their children and oftentimes the children were young when they joined. Um, out of that core group that sort of came in the early 70s, I'd say maybe there are like four people left that grew up and stayed. Yeah, my brother being one of them. But uh, the majority of children whose parents joined, by the time the kids reached adult age, around 18, they, they took off and, and never looked back. It was, you know, a very difficult life to, to be in. Yes? <laughs> Alo, uh, no, but there were numerous people that offered <laughs> as well. And, and this was a thing about Guru that he, um, you know, later on in that scene, you know, he kind of sort of um, makes something says, oh, I was talking about inwardly, not outwardly. So he would push his disciples up to the edge. And of course, he knew that his disciples you know, had that, that just kind of razor sharp faith and would do whatever he wanted them to do. So he would sort of flirt with things like that. Um, and in that sense, you know, I sort of say that I understand that rationale and that mentality of the suicide bomber, right, of the, you know, the Shaheed, because when you believe so much in that faith and that message and, you know, you're devout to that extreme, then you'll do whatever it takes. And his disciples were that way. We were that way. So, but Ala Devi, no, she's actually, um, she's a number of years older than Sri Chimoy. She's still alive. She is, you know, still on his payroll. She's kind of kept away in Hawaii at a little apartment. So she's not running the organization. I mean, she'd long been kind of kicked off, but, um, but they still have two people kind of taking care of her. Yes? So while you were in this, and you weren't allowed to talk within your family about your feelings, right. um, at any point, after you left and your mom left and your dad left, have you had those discussions? Oh, absolutely. And that's why you know, I, I wrote the book when I did, because after they had left, then we really spoke and talked about everything that had happened to us. And my mother was extremely generous in sharing um, you know, really personal, painful stories, which many of which you know, I included in the book here. So absolutely, yes. And my parents, when when they left, the divine marriage was over. My father left my mother. So that whole, you know, divine marriage was, uh, was never something that, that was going to last. Yeah. Yes? What were the financial demands that he put on the uh, disciples? Right. So the financial demands, basically we, the disciples, paid the bills. And what he would do is every month he set up something called love offering. And love offering would be that, again, he would have his throne up on you know, the, the stage and he would have a box put in front of him. 
So disciples then would file past him and put money into the box. And disciples were always craving his attention and the chance to maybe have him speak to them or smile at them or wave to them. Right? This really mattered. So if you put in you know, a lot of money into that box, then there was a good chance that you would get some recognition from him. So disciples every month would really take all the money that they could from their salaries and whatever money that they had and, and give it to Sri Chinmoy's. And that's how he ran his organization. And then on top of that, he also sold things. So every meditation, he would sell photographs of himself, um, things that he had touched were sacred objects. So, um, you know, everything from shoes that he had worn to shirts that he had worn, we would take these and buy them and, you know, put them on our shrine because. You know, again, these were sacred. These were relics of, of the guru. So that would bring in money too. And then those divine enterprises, the disciple-owned businesses, were always kind of a front for, for the money to be funneled back to him. Yeah. Yes, maybe the last question. Yeah. Um, I wonder, if he didn't demand that his disciples basically live like most of and that people form families, do you think considerably more people that's a good question. She, she asked if uh, Sri Chimwe hadn't demanded so much from his followers that they had to live like monks and nuns, whether or not more people would have stayed and whether his organization would have been bigger. Um, you know, that's, that's something I guess we'll never know. Um, one would imagine that it would, it would have attracted more people to him and more people would have been able to stay. But um, he wasn't flexible with with those rules and regulations. I mean, he really set that out for his disciples to live that way. Of course, later we kind of find out that he was doing different things, but no, he demanded absolute obedience, and that's what he expected. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, I forgot about the pictures. Should I quickly show a couple? Yeah. Okay. I am, um, I forgot. Erica had clicked onto my website where I have some photographs and I just thought I could quickly show a couple pictures here. Oh, okay. Oh, is it off? Oh. <coughs> Sorry. I totally forgot. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, oh. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. It's coming now. It's coming now. Okay. Do we have to do something to get it back? Um, give it a second. Yeah, it, it should. Hopefully, um, okay. you shouldn't have to do the, the function and the F8 key. But it's, it's detecting it now. Oh, there it is. Okay. I want to So on my website, I put up some photographs. Um, and this first picture is uh, so-called one of the famous pictures. And this was the guru holding me. And this was a photograph that many disciples had on their shrines um, because guru had said that this picture was pure soul. And it was him kind of showing you know, compassion and, and love. And disciples would meditate on this photograph. So this was actually taken by my father. This was the guru scolding me or blessing me, I don't know, <laughs> at an early age. Since he never had children, he was always sort of a little bit, a little rough with children. And this photograph was sacred. This was considered the transcendental, and he said that this photograph captured the consciousness that absolutely shows God. So every disciple had to meditate on this photograph. Uh, disciples had this in their cars to pray for protection on this. This photograph couldn't be thrown away, right? If their photograph was damaged, he told the disciple that they had to still hold on to it. So this was the sacred picture that all disciples worldwide had on their shrines and meditated on. This was a very early photo of the Guru and Alo Devi. This is when they were uh, arriving in America. And here, I think it's funny because they, they look like sort of a happy couple in this <laughs> <laughs> picture. Yeah. 
here again is, is Guru holding me and Alo Devi looking on there. This is my family. <laughs> this was uh, my brother, and myself, and my mother, and my father on my birthday. And I have on my little sari there. <laughs> all the women had to wear saris. That's what he told us, right? So saris are the traditional Indian dress. And all the men had to wear white pants and white shirts because that was a sign of purity. And uh, this photo is funny just because the Guru's blessing us and my brother's entered into the cake there. <laughs> yeah. This is just an early picture of one of his early public meditations and he's sitting here playing music and the disciples are singing behind him, the men and women and they're all in their saris and men are wearing dhotis. And this happened really early where he started recruiting people and having people come and join. This is a little washed out, but this is uh, the guru taking me for a walk around his house. This is a church that the disciples bought for guru in Bayside, Queens, that they still own, but they don't actually use. And uh, you can sort of see up here, again, the photo's a little washed out. This is the throne, so this is his throne up on the platform. And then he was blessing me on the head, and there's Alo Devi, too. And here's, again, another early photo of my family. Um, <laughs> my, my mother took the marriage as, as a true marriage and my father said he never did. He viewed it as one of the spiritual disciplines that he had to do. So you have to wake up in the morning at 5 o'clock and meditate, you have to be vegetarian, you have to be married to this woman. That's how he viewed it. So yeah. Uh, this was me with Alo Devi when she was still considered the, the consort. This was early one of Guru's early lifts, <laughs> where he lifted me up. This was at the meditation center in Norwalk. This was the bust of Guru that we had in our backyard that I was terrified of. <laughs> this was more blessings. He loved to bless on the head. He felt that that was you know, a sacred way for him to, to touch you and Here is my family up at the church. And that's my brother, my mother, my father's sister, and the person she was married to at that time. That's my father's mother. She was never a disciple, but she just came for a meditation. More pictures. At our living room in Norwalk, we had one piece of furniture, which was Guru's throne, but we weren't allowed to touch it or sit on it. So then this was Guru's throne and me. This was in front of the house in Norwalk. This was early disciples. I'll go through a little faster. This was at my father's office in Darien. This is the rabbit that I finagled my way to get. These are a photograph of the guards, his personal guards. They wore white pants, white shirts, but then had a blue tie and, and blue stripe down the pants, and that distinguished themselves as being his bodyguards. And they're here waiting for Guru's arrival. So they'd wait outside the building and then escort Guru in, you know, surround Guru, and then escort him back out. Here's, <laughs> Guru was body obsessed, and one of his life desires was to win the Nobel Prize, the true Nobel Prize. So he actually had a few disciples that he paid to work full time to court the Nobel Prize committee. Uh, so he never ended up winning it, but once he dropped a lot of weight, and again, he was always obsessed with his weight, once he dropped so much weight that he decided and awarded himself the Nobel Prize and <laughs> sold this picture saying that he had won the Nobel Prize. So uh, this is him with Mikhail Gorbachev, and they had corresponded, and Gorbachev would come and visit the guru for years. But of course, 
you know, Sri Chinmoy gave him a lot of money. So he would have disciples donate to the Gorbachev's foundation. So every time Gorbachev would come, he would receive a huge check from Guru. So like any fundraiser, right, he was smart. You come, you get your check, and you say nice things and get some photographs. So that's Gorbachev. This, <laughs> this is interesting. This, um, again, when I mentioned that he started doing these weightlifting stunts, and he considered this his miracle lift, where he said that he lifted with one arm 7,000 pounds. So as you can see, the disciples had built this contraption, and there, um, you know, he says that he lifted it up like an inch. So there it is. Was, was that tricks and mirrors? Or was it or? Well, um, this... This was a matter of sort of creative photography, and you'll see, you know, the, the rod that's holding this up. I mean, you know, it's all here, and then he would kind of grunt and groan, and then, you know, shake, and it would, with the camera down below, you could kind of show that something had happened and with the right angle. So that's what this was, yeah. Yeah. Uh, this was at Guru's house. Right? After all the meditations, the disciples who were in the inner circle would be invited back to his house where he would meditate. And um, this was one of my birthdays at his house. And this was the prized joy to be invited into the guru's house. And this was um, my graduation. The guru, this is <laughs> bizarre, but uh, to keep me boy free, when I was in high school, the guru decided that they should send me to an all-girls school. So I was sent to Greenwich Academy, which was certainly a very surreal experience <laughs> to be, um, you know, kind of thrown into that world. And so that was my graduation from Greenwich Academy. This was a parade. Every April and August, disciples from all over the world would converge in Queens at his ashram to celebrate him. So in April, it was in honor of his arrival in America, April 13th. And in August, it was in honor of his birthday and we would have activities. We'd have circuses, public parades, you name it, we would do it to honor him and to get his message out. So this is one of the parades. Uh, once I left, this was a picture of me in my gothic days, uh, trying to kind of find my way, and then finally is a last picture of my own daughter. And uh, the kind of bizarre thing that happened was, of course, you know, so central to, to my story was the idea of this myth of my birth and the story of the morning I was born that Guru came and named me and blessed me. Well, the morning that my daughter was born was the very same morning that Sri Chinmoy passed away. So it, we had a, a strange uh, completion of this circle and closure in a way that, um, yeah, is, is very surreal. Yeah, you can't kind of make that stuff up, really. And that was the last photograph. So thank you all so much for coming. <laughs>